Um, I want to say thank you to Kevin Crane, the station manager, for facilitating this, as well as the WHQR staff who are all scattered around here helping facilitate this. And thank you especially to Rob at Waterline and for the rest of the staff here for all of your help. Um, if you have questions for our panelists that you think of during this entire panel, there are note cards on these tables and pens. Please write your question down. If you want to just wave it in the air, then we're happy to come and gather them and we'll look at your questions and may maybe ask some of them at the end of the panel. Uh, we also have a storytelling corner after the panel. It's over there. So if you want to write your own remembrances or your thoughts on this panel, or if you want to share stories, we have an audio option if you might want to hear your voice on the air on WHQR. Uh, and we also have a written version, so you can put the notes of your reflections on that cute little thing that my coworker designed. So we'd love to hear from you. Um, no guarantee you'll end up on the air, but we would love to hear from you, and we might use some of your stories on the air. Um, and I also want to mention, we have a QR code reader over there, or uh, just a QR code. You can sign up for the WHQR app, or you can sign up for our newsletter over there, if you're interested in this cool radio station. Um, I will say we have one panelist who's running a little bit late, so we'll introduce her when she arrives, but I'm going to have each of the panelists introduce themselves with their pronouns and um, how you relate to the LGBTQ community. I will start. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Kelly Knoyer. I'm a reporter at WHQR. I'm also part of the bisexual gang, so I'm out here, and I use she, her pronouns. So, would you like to start? Sure. Uh, my name is Brooke Lambert. The pronouns I use are she, her, and hers. Um, I currently serve as the director of the Moen Schultz LGBTQA Resource Center at UNCW. Um, I identify as a queer woman, and I am extremely happy to be here, so thank you so much for having us. My name is Erin Jones. I am a co-owner of the Roasted Bookery uh, Bookstore. My pronouns are she, her. I am gaily forward, which is what my high school friends came up with when I was the straight one in the group. Um, but I, we, I do have a queer child that we support greatly. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> I am Quaylen Bowen. Can you hear me? A little higher on that one? I think it's the fourth one. Yep. I'm Quaylen Bowen, and my pronouns are she, her. I'm the co-host of a WHQR podcast called As Told By Us, um, as well as I work at Northside Food Co-op as the strategic partnership coordinator, and I identify as queer and young. <coughs> I'm T.R. Nunley. I use he, him pronouns. I'm an out, proud, transgender male, and uh, in the community I do a few support groups um, for transgender adults, transgender kids, parents of transgender folks, as well as some other LGBT events that happen within the community. And if that's not enough, I also have um, a Facebook group called Wilmington Pride, which is an online hub for people to connect and get to know each other and find LGBT resources. And y'all have like 6,000 members now, I think? Yeah. Add me. Add me. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm Caroline Morin. My pronouns are she, her. I'm the executive director of the LGBTQ Center of the Cape Fear Coast. I identify as a queer woman, um, and I'm excited to be here today. <laughs> Hi, my name is Takesha McIntyre, and I'm also on the board with Caroline, and I'm also on the board with um, Shelley O'Rourke, and we're on the Victory Fund Board, which um, also elects candidates in uh, North Carolina and also in other states, and my pronouns are she and her. All right, wonderful. Um, just housekeeping, if any of you have kind of quiet mics, feel free to move them a little closer. Um, you're free to move them around a little bit if you want. <laughs> All right, so we are going to start by talking about LGBTQ youth. Um, this is something that's being legislated a lot in our culture right now, and especially in North Carolina. So let's start with books, because Erin runs the Roasted Bookery, which focuses on this quite a bit. Uh, how do you feel seeing books about the queer perspective being taken out of public libraries and school libraries where young LGBTQ folks could look for that representation? And I say this knowing that Pender County Schools just took eight books out of school libraries this week. Um. So, it's dumb. <laughs> um, I feel like 
this is an age-old question of, and really the answer to it is fear, right? Um, people are scared of what they don't know or what they don't understand. And when you don't have something that represents you, you find yourself um, having these feelings of <laughs> sadness. <laughs> Someone's phone is picking up on the system. Oh, that's why. <laughs> it is not me. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you, have, you have kids that feel unseen. Um, and so by removing these books from the libraries and schools, um, it shows me that they don't want kids to understand their sexuality. And while it may be developing, there's nothing in a book. Y'all, I have a queer kid. I read a lot of what was offered to me when I was a young parent with my kid. My kid's not straight, and most of the people that were in the books we were reading were straight. So it doesn't work that way. Um, they need to see themselves in books. From a very young age, all kids need to see all kinds of, other, of families and other children represented in books so that we can grow empathy because that's the biggest issue is being able to empathize with people who aren't like us. Um, stop banning books. If you don't like the book, don't read it. <laughs> but I, I encourage all books to be read, and we try to bring that within our bookstore, but also into, into schools and into the community as well, so that everybody is represented. I mean, for those of you on the panel, can you talk at all about uh, maybe a book from your childhood that you saw as representation, or maybe as the opposite of that? Um, how have how have those books shaped your experiences? Anyone? <laughs> okay, I mean, I can say I had no visibility. I didn't even know women could be part of the LGBTQ community until I was well into high school. So, uh, I mean, there's a trite little thing. If you can see it, you can be it. And the opposite is also true. If you have no models, you just don't know. But it didn't mean I wasn't queer. It just meant I was ashamed, confused, alone. That's really the result here. You're never going to keep people from being queer. You're never going to keep people from being trans. You're just going to make their lives and experiences more painful, more difficult. And then sometimes we know what the end result of that is. All right, um, moving on to the next question. Across the country and in North Carolina, we've seen a flurry of bills fi filed to prevent trans youth from participating in school sports. What is your take on that debate? Anyone? It's also stupid. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I think that that's ridiculous. When I was in high school, there was no girls soccer team. I played on the boys soccer team. I did for three years until they finally did get a girls soccer team and it was a terrible mistake. <laughs> it wasn't, it was good to have it. But I mean, nobody cared. I learned how to change clothes on a bus <laughs> without being, you know, showing all the things. But I think that kids need to be kids and play where they feel comfortable. And I don't think that anybody on any team has any trouble with this. I think that there are people that are upset in the world um, because, again, it's not what their perception of a, a girls' or boys' sports, I say that in quotes, with or should be, it should look like. But, yeah. TR? Yeah, so, <clears throat> you know, I think, you know, there are lots of reasons why kids join sports. Love of the game, socialize, exercise, Winning, maybe not so, you know, is in there, but, you know, people are saying, and let's let's just break it down, it's trans girls, not trans boys, but trans girls, because people think that maybe they have an advantage. Well, in sports, we celebrate when kids have an advantage. When you have a seven foot tall kid, you are giving that kid scholarships, you're like endorsing them, you're encouraging them to play basketball. I mean, the slight advantage that a trans girl might have over other cisgender girls is so ridiculously small um, that I just don't understand why you're preventing that trans girl from being on a sport that, you know, she feels most comfortable in. And if you're worried about cisgender boys going on a team 
uh, that is girls so that they can like win, ban them. I mean, that's simple. And saying, you know what, this is a hate crime or like a hate crime and they shouldn't be part of sports anymore, if that's your concern. Um, but just sidelining a trans girl from playing sports because you think that maybe she has a slight advantage is just crazy. And obviously you don't want trans boys to be with girls. So you have to, you have to <clears throat> pick your battle and, and follow through with it because it doesn't, it, the idea of just preventing a trans girl from playing sports just because you think of what might happen is just ridiculous and you're hurting that kid. Um, go ahead. I just had a, a thought, even from the back to the book question, um, just even the sheer idea about like the, com the conversation around having an advantage, right? Um, I think it's worth like noting how uh, people in certain positions of power, once they figure, oh, someone in a marginalized or disenfranchised position can have the, the position to have some type of advantage, I have an advantage, that presents some type of threat, right? So that's like, oh, no, I can have the advantage and the privilege and the power, but you can't. And that strikes some fear, right? Whenever you give that, you know, equity or to someone else, it's like a, re a relinquishing of a certain power that you may have, and that draws fear. So I, I wanted to speak to you. Absolutely. Um, joining us now is our final panelist. Thank you so much for coming. I know there was a little bit of an issue with the getting a ride here, but yes. Ebony Valentino, do you want to introduce yourself and your pronouns and your relationship to the queer community? Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Ebony Valentino. Um, I'm one of the few black trans women living in this community here in Wilmington. Um, I originate from Florida, but my dad is from here, so my dad is originally from here, so I came here. Uh, when I was about 14 um, and then I say so my whole transition everything began here as well I'm also um, I host first Fridays and third Fridays at Ibiza I do a lot of brunches here I'm sorry I'm a little hot right now <laughs> um, so I do a lot of things um, as far as like brunches and drag shows and things like that here in the community so as far as pride coming up you'll see me a lot next month so um, that's who I am here so Thank you so much for joining us. No we can like fan you a little bit with this. <laughs> Do you mind if I comment on no, on the on the athlete? Um, I think it's important to note too um, that I feel like a lot of it is just rooted in misogyny as well. Because as Tr mentioned, um, a lot of it it's all around trans women and trans girls, right? So it's this idea that anybody that is assigned male at birth is inherently going to be better than anybody that is assigned female at birth, right? So I think part of it is this is that idea. And I think it's important to note too that when we're looking at international and national competitions such as like the Olympics, so the IOC has had trans inclusive policies since the early 2000s, right? So None of this is new, and in fact, we've had trans-inclusive policies both with the IOC and the NCAA for a number of years, and it's only recently, now all of a sudden, where we have these concerns, right? When, oh, all of these, you know, cis men are gonna come and dominate these competitions, when, again, we've had these policies for over 20 years at this point, and how many times have we seen any of that happen? We have, like, it's not real, right? So these fears that they're talking about, they're, they're just not real. There's no data to support any of it. And if we really want to continue, if we want to have trans-inclusive policies, we need to continue to support our trans youth, and we need to give them options for transitioning and making sure that we're supporting that transition, however that looks for them. Um, because taking that away is obviously not going to solve the, the issue either, right? So I think it's, I think when we're talking about um, sports and competition, I think it's, you know, about making sure that we are supporting everybody, as TR mentioned. Um, there, there are a lot of reasons why youth play sports. I grew up playing sports, and for me it was an outlet. It was where I connected with my peers. It was where I made my friends. And to keep people from participating in that because of some made up fear is legitimately going to, it's gonna drive people to end their lives, right? Because that's the only place where they're feeling connected. So um, yeah, I just wanted to make sure to say that. Thank you. 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 Th
Yeah. Um, just, Ebony, in case you wanted to jump in on this question, um, we're talking about uh, the bills that have been filed across the country and in North Carolina to ban trans youth specifically from participating in school board sports. So if you want to comment on that, you're welcome to, or we can move on to the next question. Um, okay, for I'm playing sports when I was younger then. <laughs> 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 I wanted to make a comment on that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, when I was playing sports, I um, a lot of the girls that I was hanging out with didn't play sports, so I played with a lot of the guys. And I was young, and they didn't really look at me as a girl playing sports. They looked at me as a friend playing sports. And they tackled me like I was one of the guys. They, uh, I was bloodied up and everything. And I'm just saying, it, to me, I realized that it's more of fear in adults and not children. So let children be children. Let's not um, look at them and categorize them as, uh, let, let them be who they want to be is what I'm just trying to say to end of uh, what everybody's saying, if that makes sense. Yeah. All right, next question. Um, I want to ask about the current availability of gender-affirming care, specifically for youth, um, and what you might think of recent legislation that has been filed to prevent youth from accessing that care. And I also, just to broaden this a little bit, if you want to speak to the availability of gender-affirming care for adults as well, I actually am not sure how it is in North Carolina. I'm from Oregon and it's quite different there, so um, I'd love to hear that perspective both for under and over 18 populations. <laughs> so if a trans youth, um, you know, decides that they would like to transition, first of all, they have to be a certain age, um, and it depends on the doctor, but you have to have the parent's approval. If there are two parents, the parent, the other parent's approval. You have to have the primary doctor, you have a, a therapist, and that child that all agree that maybe hormones would be the right choice. So that's five different guesses that have to happen before that kid can, you know, go, you know, get hormones. You also have to have a blood test to make sure that they're safe. Um, and that hormones won't affect them in a negative way. There's very slight, small chance that it would have a negative effect, but doctors want to make sure. Um, and so, and at that point, you know, there are only about, and I'm not going to name who those doctors are, but there's about three doctors in the Wilmington area that provide care for trans teens. Um, and again, they have to have all those ducks in a row before they can even request hormones. Um, the other thing with adults, um, they have to go through the same sort of thing, they just don't need parent, parent permission. And then if a child wanted to uh, have surgery, they would have to have not only their parents' approval themselves, a therapist, a second therapist, their primary care provider and the surgeon all saying yes. So to that extent, like now we need a legislator to decide that it's a yes. It doesn't make any sense. It's it should be a um, a decision between a kid, the parent, and their doctors. It shouldn't be anybody else in that room. Um, and it's so it's it's already there are so many barriers, but that's the way it's designed so that. Because we don't want kids to make a, a rash decision uh, on what they want. We want them to think about it. We want to talk about it. A therapist has to agree to it. You know, so there's all these things in place because we care about kids, not because we want to hurt them. Um, and so I think that the legislators should just get out of the way. I would, I would like to speak as a parent. Um, how difficult it is to find information. Um, I'm very thankful for TR and his group um, because it is a wealth of information, but I feel like it shouldn't be so hard. Um, nobody's trying to mutilate your children. Nobody's trying to change something that isn't wanted. Um, 
and it's just it's heartbreaking to be to have to look at your kid and be like, so you gotta wait because we have to talk to 700 other people, and oh by the way, you probably are gonna need to freeze it this way so that the legislator doesn't come in and start making laws on you and telling me that I can't be your parent anymore. Um, Florida is super scary right now, um, in my opinion. We had planned a trip and we no longer feel safe that we could go. We are scared our child might be taken away from us. We might be arrested. Our other child might be taken because, heaven forbid, we're obviously you know, not abusing our child, but Florida sees it as that, as you know, supporting a child who is figuring out who they are in the world, and heaven forbid we would want them to be comfortable. Um, but I really do appreciate that there is a community here that does support and has the information that we need to help our own children, but it is really difficult. If I could just like add a zoom out real quick, straight cisgender people are totally fine with gender affirming care for themselves. Women take estrogen, men take Viagra. Y'all have breast reduction and breast augmentation all the time. Like it's only when it comes to LGBTQ people that we're suddenly not okay with gender affirming care. So there's no other way to describe that than purely discrimination. For me, I wish that we would, I wish that they wouldn't focus so much on the negative effects of what it can do and the positive things. Because me, myself being trans and not being able to transition until I was older. I didn't transition, I'm 33 now, just turned 33 uh, about a week ago. And I didn't start transi transitioning until I was 25. But for a very long time, I did not know who I was for a few times out of my life. I tried to take my own life because I was so busy trying to figure out who I was and why I felt so different, why I felt so uncomfortable around these people that were supposed to be my peers, you know, in a community, especially coming from the black community, you know, if anyone really knows me, know I grew up in the, the ghettos of Wilmington, you know, but I'm happy about that because those same communities got to see a different point of view from what they see on TV or what they hear in the negative aspects. They got to see someone firsthand grow and be happy. So I wish we, I wish they would focus more on those things of how it can change someone's life for the better and it can potentially save a child's life. You know what I'm saying? Because before I started transitioning, I felt like I didn't have a place. And once I did, no matter who left me, no matter what my family said or anything, I felt happy, I felt content. So I wish they would understand those things can be the same things that happen with children. But children have more of a support with, like TR said, needing you know, your parents' approvals, therapy, and things like that. I didn't have to go through that. But it would have been nice if I did have those things and not trying to figure it out on my own. I wish that they would realize that there are already a bunch of resources here that are saying this is okay, you know, and this child is gonna be fine. We have a, a huge support system here that loves and cares for this child. We don't need to focus on the negative of you're mutilating a child because no one's <coughs> what the fuck is doing that, right? But We'll bleep that for the radio. <laughs> <laughs> you're fine, you're fine. Um, I just want to point out that does come full circle. You weren't here for this question, but we were talking about book bans and representation and the way you felt when you were young, not understanding who you were, you didn't see that representation. So it does kind of come full circle to that. Anyone else have anything to add on that topic? Okay, next topic. Um, I want to ask, so we're sticking with legislation because there's been so many bills, um, more than 300 in the last year in the United States. The Parents' Bill of Rights here in North Carolina, AKA, as the Democrats are calling it, the Don't Say Gay Bill, SB 49, it prohibits instruction on gender identity for most grade schoolers, I think it's kindergarten through fourth grade, and it would require schools to notify parents if a student uses different gender pronouns than their assigned identity at, in school. So what do you think the impact of this bill might be on LGBTQ youth? It's going to be horrible, honestly. Um, I'm going to speak from my own experience because that's the only place I can come from. Um, growing up in my household, we didn't have this, but, you know, I have a black father, you know, my mother as well, and they knew nothing about being trans, you know, they knew nothing about any of these things. The only thing that my dad would say they knew of growing older was gay men and gay women. That was it. You know, anything else, they, they just, you know, didn't associate with or anything or didn't have any knowledge of so um finding comfort outside of you know what i'm saying your your home and your family and friends or your counselors at school 
can also, again, save a life. It really can because I had a counselor when I went to school who I could tell any and everything to, and I knew that was my safe place. You know, when I ran away from home, that was the first person I called because I didn't feel safe because my dad saw things that weren't of him or felt like he didn't approve of, so he wanted to throw me out. So before that happened, I left. And she was one of the first people I called, and she also helped save me. She got me to a group home. You know, she helped put money in my pocket so I was able to eat. She had me going to school, you know, so I can graduate. So I think that it's horrible that they're saying that because you never know what potential damage you could be doing to a child in their own home without actually, you know, diving in a little bit deeper. So, that's what I And I, I actually agree with. I agree because um, when I was growing up as well, I was going through so much um, because I had to hide that inside of me. And I was going through depression, I was acting out, I was showing out in school because um, I wasn't able to consult with my teachers, um, anybody in school. And then once I did tell a family member about it because I um, couldn't understand it myself, she went and told family. and. Um, they actually put me in therapy like something was was uh, wrong with me. And um, I think at the time, um, the, fam the family member didn't understand. I'm assuming maybe they didn't, but it was more of, it was a problem, more than it was um, just me being who I was. So for years, I went through it being a problem to the fact that I just uh, learned to hate myself inside because I didn't have anybody to talk to or anybody to basically um, to say to them like this is who I am and them to say hey it's okay so uh, I learned I taught myself to hate myself to hate who I was because I just couldn't talk to anybody and then um, I went to college it took me to go to college and to meet folks that was like who I was to say, hey, it's okay. You are okay. You're fine. You're you're normal. It's okay. And I just think that um, it shouldn't have took me to go to college to be around that. So I, I think it needs to start as, um, I think we, it should start at youth. It, we need that. We need that in our life. So 99% of the kids that are in my group or more um, come from parents that are cisgender or straight folks and they're oftentimes blindsided by the fact that their child is trans and so they come in and there is an adjustment period um, so I cannot imagine how a parent without that type of support is going to react to their child being going by a different name or a different gender um, than they anticipated, and I feel like that is only going to result in that child being in a dangerous situation, um, as well as an increase uh, children in foster care, which is already astronomical right now with trans kids, um, or even LGBT kids. So you're just setting those kids up to fail. They're not able to like take the time to figure out if their parent is going to be supportive, and now you're forcing that child to live in an environment that they are not supported and could be uh, abused. So. Um, I'm a former teacher. <laughs> um, my husband and I both left uh, education last year, and we were thankfully at a supportive school that was very affirming um, of children and names they wanted to be called, <coughs> pronouns they wanted to use. We were always very, very careful, at least my husband and I were, I can't speak for all the teachers, um, of asking each student if they wanted to go by a preferred name and pronouns what they are called at home. And if we have to call home, what do we say? Um, I cannot fathom somebody telling me I'm going to lose my job if I have to out a kid. Um, it's not okay. It's not, it's not my place to do that. I always felt my place was to be there and be supportive of our children, to provide them with safe spaces where they can be who they are and, and explore that. Um, I worked really hard to make sure that there were books in my classroom library that 
offered not only stories but educational things that would help kids to understand all the different genders and sexualities that are out there and for me too because I'm a straight white woman and I didn't know all of this. I grew up where it was you're gay or you're lesbian and maybe you're bi and that was it. And to learn all of this stuff was amazing and great and then to have my kid feel safe enough to tell us this stuff made me very happy and made me feel like, you know, like I need to give myself a pat on the back. I don't, but it's, I know that there are a lot of homes that we're not. And if kids don't have that safe space, that safe person where they can talk to somebody and know that they're not going to go run to their parents, um, I agree, it's, it's detrimental. That, again, it's a, a fear that is unbased and is just saying you should be more like this quote unquote quote normal which is not anything anymore like we're supposed to be this melting pot which I think is kind of a crazy weird term to you because we're all our individual people we shouldn't be melting into one we should be who we are and be accepting of those but when you're young and figuring that out 100% you need to have somebody and I think Nobody's talking to kindergartners about sex, y'all. Come on. But you can show representation in books, you know? It, that's not a hard thing to do. If you can talk about a mom and a dad in a household, you can talk about two moms or two dads or how, whatever your household looks like, and that's okay. Kids get it. They don't care. They're like, okay, cool, and then they move on. It's the parents and the adults that feel like we're somehow grooming children and turning them into to something that we're not doing. Anyway. I mean, this just also makes me think about, like, clearly legislators don't talk to kids either. <laughs> like, I, as a mom, like, first of all, my children, my nine-year-old uh, knows how to get pronouns together. Like, she will get you together if you don't get someone else's pronouns, uh, pronouns together. Like, they are that aware. So that just lets me know the disconnect between people who are making these decisions and the actual children and the people that they're making the decisions for. They don't have those conversations. Like, kids are already out here using these pronouns. Um, they are, they're here. They're not, and I think if we were to see that, we would see a lot of, a lot of kids, like, rebelling. Seriously. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. So this is going to be a really broad question. But how do you think Wilmington does as a city in supporting the queer community here? Do you feel welcomed and supported in this community? No. <laughs> we hear from the audience, no. <laughs> I feel like they can do more. Um, I feel like they can definitely do more. I feel like um, there isn't enough representation for us here. We have a committee. Where are they? I don't know. Um, I'm just saying. Um, when there are like uh, a lot of events going on, um, I feel like, where are we? Yeah. You know, we don't have enough of our people that want to like be, you know, that want to represent us and represent our community. And I mean, you can do it with two people, but it's 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 funner with two hundred. <laughs> I mean, you know, um, I just feel like they don't do enough to be honest. I feel like they limit us to drag shows and like maybe like a little like pride event here like they're going to do next month and that's all you get that's that's it and those i've noticed are mostly by private businesses it's not like you know i'm from oregon in portland the city supports a pride parade so i don't think that we have that kind of thing here no and i don't think we're going to get it because <laughs> <laughs> i'm serious i feel like for one I feel like a lot of these people um, that are, you know, older are, are kind of settled into that same thing of like, well, what we've been doing is fine, so we don't want to like do any more. We don't want to push the agenda. You know, there's already all these bills being passed. We don't want to make it look like we're trying to push the agenda to force ourselves in people's faces. So we're not going to, you know, ask for a pride parade. We're not going to try to do a pride float in a Zaya festival, you know, to represent our community. We won't do those things because that's just doing too much for people to dislike us more. When, who gives a fuck? I'm sorry. <laughs> like, who cares? You know what I'm saying? Like, we're here already. We're not going anywhere. So why not do the most? You know, I'm not going to not wear makeup in public because I feel like it's going to make someone else feel comfortable. I don't care how you feel about me in public and the way I look. I feel comfortable. I feel beautiful. So I'm going to do and represent myself however I want to. I feel like we should do that as a community, but more, you know? 
Parades, and I go to um, when I was in Virginia or when I go to Washington D.C. I mean, it's so much more an enhancement when it comes to LGBTQ plus events. And it, I mean, <laughs> you come to Wilmington, and it's like, oh, blah. I mean, there's nothing here that's going on when it, when you go to bigger cities and everybody is just so much more prideful. I mean, we do do some things, but I mean, I know we can do way much better. But I do. Uh, commend Caroline because she tries so much and she does, I mean, you do, you do, I mean, you do a lot and I mean, I know it's so hard for you, but I do commend you for everything you do. I appreciate that. It's really a community effort what we do at the LGBTQ Center, but I'd say my experience of being queer here is like if you're white, socioeconomically privileged, and cisgender, you're good to go. And then what I also find is that those people then hide at home. They're like, oh, we don't go out or we don't come and help support things because we're cool. Well, I see that as a failure of us generationally as a queer community. We as elders, I'm 34, but I'm an elder now. A lot of people I know are dead. So we are the ones who have to bear this flag, but it is our responsibility to reach back and clear the path for people who are coming behind us. It's not okay to just get married by your house and live in your little white privileged life. This is damaging to the community long term. It doesn't advance any of us. And as long as like trans women of color have less rights than I do in town, I can't sleep well at night knowing that people that are part of my community are being mistreated. And so really like it's great for us to have pride events and things like that, but we need people to vote. We need people to go to boring city council meetings. We need people to go to school board. We need people to do the really unglamorous work that actually moves us forward over the arc of generations. It's, it's about so much more than just like going out and feeling comfortable holding my partner's hand in public. <clears throat> think that if the city and the county funded a lot of the stuff that Caroline's doing, she would have more money to actually put together events that are more um, diverse and, and pull in different people. So I think, um, yeah. They're great. Fund it. They're great to help you. I say Caroline for me. <laughs> Did you say Caroline for mayor? Yeah. <laughs> no, no, Y'all would all hate that. <laughs> all right. Um, this is my unfun question for this half of the panel. But we've had a few incidents of Proud Boys showing up to LGBTQ events in town. Both of those for children, um, like the Queer Story Hour that was a reading of Heather Has Two Mommies, and also. I think they went to a drag event that was at Pallet, and they've been to other drag events. What is your reaction to these incidents, and what would you like to see from the community in reaction to these incidents? You guys are creepy. <laughs> that is so creepy. When I saw the picture from the Pallet event, like someone's literally like in the event. This is not outside of the event. You weren't like in the parking lot across the street. You weren't on the sidewalk. You were like inside taking a picture of someone performing and then you and then went on to say oh well you know it was a great event because there were no children there my whole thing is what were you going to do if there were children there what are you going to do you know what i'm saying like what 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 is your plan to do if you saw a kid if you saw a parent with their child in this event what are you going to do and that's that's what confuses me and what makes me afraid you know because it's like well if this is your mindset to do weird things like this, you know, you can go about it other ways. You could have been here, you know, speaking with us and, and speaking your piece, but instead you choose to like hide in corners and do things. Come on now. We have to do better than that. <laughs> if, you can't be a proud boy if you're, you know, hiding in the bushes. Like, that is crazy to me. That, yes, that is crazy. I'm like, and we work these events, you know? So for me, I think about the pride that's that's an event that's coming up. You know, we're outside, so this isn't inside where it's a private event and we can tell people not to bring their kids. Last year there was kids. Someone was picking up a baby. Baby, that's on them. I don't. I don't know. I don't care personally. I personally don't care what you do with your kids. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I don't. You know, if you want to bring your kids, bring your kids. If you don't, by all means. You know, I don't want to step on them anyway. 
So, but I'm serious. Like, it's crazy when they bring kids because they like push them on the stage just like, babe, that is a child. <laughs> and I'm not paying attention. So, it's like, I, it makes me afraid to, to, to have allies in our community that just want to come out, support us, and enjoy ourselves. But you have people like this hiding in bushes and hiding around corners with, and you don't know what their, what their intention is. So, that's my thing with that. That's just like, Grow up, seriously. I mean, and drop the balls that you have, and come out of the and come out of the bushes. That's ridiculous. I mean, so I, I would say that uh, before the library incident, I was very casual in when I would say where I was going, what I was doing. I was going to a pride event. I posted. Then I started getting screenshots from my friends. <coughs> on all these weird sites that they've been monitoring my Facebook. I feel like I'm nobody, right? But like they're like gonna like maybe show up at these events that I'm like casually going to. So I stopped advertising when I'm going to smaller events because I because I'm not afraid for myself, bring it on, but I'm just afraid for the folks that are at there at that event, and I also don't want to like bring negative attention to events that are happening for our community. So I'm a lot better about like not advertising where I'm going to be, and then I'll do it afterwards. Um, but it, yeah, just like Ebony said, it's super creepy and. You know, I think that when we do have these events that are happening in the community, please show up. Because if we show up in numbers, they're not going to because they're going to be scared little boys at home. So please show up so that we all can be protected because it's about numbers. And uh, if we have more numbers, they'll be too afraid to show up because um, I'm sure that Ebony has some stilettos that she could <laughs> poke them with if things got too bad. But, but I'm not going to play with you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Ebony don't play around. <laughs> okay, we don't do that over here. We don't listen. <laughs> but I hope, and, and, and if they are going to see this, I just hope that you guys can do the same thing. Just like we show up in numbers, that does not mean that we're showing up with a violent mentality, that we're showing up hoping to like bully you guys or anything. Us showing up in numbers is showing that we as a community are here to support each other. You can do the same thing, but come with an open mind. Come with an open mind to pull one of us to the side and have that conversation. You have a parent here. Don't you think you will want her opinion versus trying to make her fearful of bringing her child somewhere? That would make more sense. I mean, my children are 15 and 17, so we don't go to the story times anymore at the library, but had we, I, it, it's mind-boggling to me that you feel, that anybody would feel that they had a right to say what I should do with my child. Um, and But to come into an event where there are small children, that is causing trauma on these children, and supposedly you're protecting them, and that is not okay to me. Um, you don't have the right to come into here and tell me how what I should be reading to my child. That's not your choice, that's mine. And you also don't have the right to cause my child trauma and fear in a place that is supposed to be a public, safe space. Um, but that is from a parent's perspective and also I feel too they are the creepiest people I've ever met. Creepy. Creepy. I haven't met them, but I've seen them, I should say. And, it was still, and I will also say that the parent that did go to that event is still being harassed today online. All right, I want to um, completely change the tone here. Um, I want to ask about gay bars in Wilmington and other queer spaces. Um, I know before the pandemic there were a few more gay bars. I want to hear a little bit about queer history in Wilmington. I'm a newcomer. I moved here in 2021. So where are the spots, you guys? <laughs> where are they? <laughs> um, well, you said gay 
aka bars. Um, I don't know about bars. <laughs> I wish there were more places. I wish this was Boys Town in Chicago, <laughs> where you have, I mean, blocks of like our community. It is crazy. If I could like live in Boys Town, I would. No shade to Wilmington. I love it. But baby, nothing on Boys Town. Right now, they don't even. Well, honestly, I work at Ibiza, they don't even call it a gay bar, they call it an alternative club. And that is to make it comfortable for the straight community, here we are again, doing the same thing to make ourselves uncomfortable, to make other people feel comfortable. So it's not even a gay bar, it is an alternative club. And when you go in, you're going to see the same thing. Now, I will say, Ibiza is one of the only places I go to, not because I'm fearful of going anywhere else, but... At the same time, mostly I'm going to run into my friends there, my own community. Um, there is a, a, a good bit of us in there, but you will see on Friday and Saturday nights that there is like 80% of the straight Marines and 20% of our community. But again, that is because we don't show up. That is again because we, are, we see these people coming in, coming in. It's like, okay, well, they're taking over, so we're just going to step back and not come. And that is exactly what happened. So it's also one of the only 18 and up clubs here. So you're gonna get that anyway because you have a lot of your college students. But I will say everyone that I've met at Ibiza, whether they're straight or whatever, um, it's all love. So it's all love. Even from the crazy drunk Marines, it's all love, honestly. I have a good time there meeting my friends. I wish we did have more though, as far as like just places where we can just like lounge and talk and just, you know, because sometimes the club environment can be too much. And sometimes for the people who aren't, you know, drinkers or you don't really want to talk to drunk people. You kind of want to just sit, you know, and maybe have a drink and have a moment like this. I wish we did have somewhere like that. But we don't as far as I know, unless anyone knows. I don't know. Any, I think um, this is a conversation that has had among so many folks, especially people of color here in Wilmington. Um, because where are we? Where are we, right? I think that's a question that I get a lot of times from folks who move here from other places, trying to find people and connect with people who look like them. Um, they they don't see us, right? Um, that was an issue I had when I, and I'm a Wilmingtonian, I'm from Wilmington, I'm, I'm born and raised here. As far as like the history, I mean, as a kid, I know like, there was like one club called Mickey Rabbit, mm -hmm. and my mom and them used to go like all the time. And then that was like the that was like the Ibiza, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then from that, then you get like Ibiza. And then, but I went off to college, and I after I graduated, I went to Raleigh, um, and that's when I stepped. And I realized like the culture there is mm -hmm. totally different. It's like a subculture, but you have black and brown people like clubs were like way different experience. And then we were doing something every night, like literally every night. Um, I hadn't gone to a straight club in years, so I moved back to Wilmington. And then I'm like, so where are the black and brown queer people? You know, I, where where where's the Jay say? Where is the vote? Like it was like none of that, um, except for the rocks and the rhino when we had people going out to clubs. Like, and that was that was a straight club, you know. Mm -hmm. But as a black woman, I still had was missing that piece of that culture too. So even in spaces like that, that speaks to like the intersectionality part of it, uh, being queer, but also being black. And that's a totally different experience. And then not having a space where you can go to, that feels very much isolating. Um, and so we've like created these subcultures and these little pockets here and there with our own people and our own tribe, like everything we're speaking to, like, but we do, we do should show up more, right? Um, make, but also have availability, have access to more spaces that are inclusive um, that we feel yes. safe in, you know what I mean? So that's been my experience. Um, I'm talking with folks about how do we create those spaces where people come out, um, and that's a conversation a lot of folks have been having, like creating other groups so we can like create those spaces that have access um, so, so we can show up because we deserve to have fun too. <laughs> We're out here and it, does, it shouldn't take us having to travel to other cities and other states to enjoy ourselves, like I'm from here, I should be able to go somewhere here that is inclusive, um, that can also have fun too, and see, be around people that enjoy me and I enjoy them, enjoy my time, but not feeling like, do I belong in this place? Like, as soon as you walk in there, it's like, okay, this is not for me, right? So we don't want that, but we need to create those spaces. Well, that's a great idea. 
build your build your ideal gay space, you guys. What yeah. would what would it look like to have the ideal queer community space, whether it's a bar or not? What would that look like? Well, it's it's crazy. She said that you know we travel to other places yeah. to, especially us being black, yeah. you know, and and traveling to other places places to go because Wilmington used to have on Thursdays they used to have hip hop night yeah. and. We were that place where everyone would come to, and this was only in what 2000. I didn't go out. I didn't. The first club I ever went to was Ibiza, and that was when I was 19 in 2009. So, um, that was. I mean, everyone used to come down here. I mean, Charlotte, South Carolina, everywhere in North Carolina. Honestly, um, South Carolina used to have people coming from Atlanta just to come party here. It was crazy. But you met so many people, and that's what took us to those moments. We're traveling to other cities. You know, to to see those friends that will come and see us. So I would love to, you know, link and try to figure out how we can get that back here. Um, I mentioned it. I don't know if I'll be just open to doing that Thursdays again, but um, it would be so nice to have something like that here. And not specifically saying it has to be like a hip hop night or anything like that, but a space where we can come and enjoy ourselves because Friday and Saturdays are, I mean. We can enjoy ourselves, but, but I also it's think it's okay to say, and I don't think it's okay to say it's just what not you do. You know, yeah. I think so many times, like we fear of like uh, pushing folks out, and that we push ourselves out. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I think it's okay to say no. This night is for us, and not to say it's not for you too. You're invited. You're, you're all invited. But it's okay to. I think yeah, we should start saying that. <laughs> we should have Latin night as well, and that was really yeah, nice. That's fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. it brought out your Latin community. That's a part of our community as well. So yeah. I would love to, you Let's know, have bad. something like that again. Because mm -hmm. we don't have anything here. So if you're looking for a party, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is kind of a silly question, but it's because I think it's fun. Um, what is your favorite stereotype about a part of the LGBTQ community? Um, for me, it's bisexual finger guns, so <laughs> <laughs> we're going to leave behind everybody who's straight in the audience, apologies in advance, but what's your favorite stereotype? <laughs> I can like always clock a queer woman by her carabiner. <laughs> 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 Yeah. <laughs> uh, my community is just for me being a black trans woman. It's just always an extraness with us. Like you can just tell when it's one of the girls because they extra just like me. It's like, girl, you do not have to have that much hair on your head. Like, <laughs> like we joke on ourselves so much. Like it is crazy. And then it's always you can tell like the walk and the mannerisms. It's like, girl, you are about to break in your back. <laughs> Like that, that we always joke about. We always look at me like that's one of the girls right there. <laughs> that's one of the girls. I don't think I have favorite. You don't have a favorite? But I think like one I'm like, and maybe kind of the U-Haul lesbian thing. Like, <laughs> so my friend <laughs> they are just they're very diverse. Because it's true. It's yeah. <laughs> it's just like, come on, how y'all know each other? Okay. I heard several off mic, but maybe we don't want to share them with the general public. They're secrets. They're secret. <laughs> we have our own secret stereotypes. <laughs> it's not just the gay agenda. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so just to wrap things up here, um, we've talked about a lot of pretty negative things tonight. Or it's not nighttime. We've talked about a lot of pretty negative things this afternoon, but I would love to spin this towards the positive. What is one of your favorite things about the queer community in the Kikir region? Everything, uh, everything. I love us for real. Like, I love my community. I love, like, running into my own people in public and just the love that we give each other. Like, I love the smiles and the genuine love that we give each other. That, I just love it because in certain other places with bigger communities, you do run into more of the competition and you know the cliques and things like that. But because we are such a small community here, 
I feel like it brings us closer together, especially when we're out in public, you know, because in certain places, you go, most of the, some of the community, they'll, you know, judge you the same way the straight community does. But here, I do enjoy the love that we give each other. That is like my favorite, honestly. And I agree with that, too, because I love the April Fars that I meet, the Shelly Aurora, the Kelly. You know, the love that I have and the love that I see when I see Carolina and Wilmington. And even though, yes, there's some hate around, there's so much love here. You know, it's so much love that's spread around. And when I met Carolina in 2020, or something like that, something like that she showed me so much love and now she's my sister. I mean, come on, where can you get that at? Here in Wilmington, North, motherfucking Carolina. <laughs> so where I'd rather be? Here in Carolina. So that's where I leave you at. Give it to you one. <laughs> so one of my favorite things about Wilmington, again, is community. And there's an amazing group called the Owls, which are these seniors that come together and they're really amazing. It's a huge crowd of seniors who are LGBT. They go out to different uh, spots like bars or restaurants, and they're just amazing. And they uh, greet each other with hugs, and there's so much laughter in the room. You think, okay, this is, this is amazing. Um, and then I guess I'm a little biased, but I adore my little trans babies. I call them. We have a group of at least 20 kids that kind of come and go um, that identify as trans or non-binary and they're just like the smartest just well-rounded uh, kids you know from 11 to 17, 18 um, and they're teaching me stuff and you know, oftentimes people are like, oh, TR, you're doing such a great job. I'm not doing anything. <laughs> I'm just creating a space for them to be. And when a new kid comes in, they're super, like, awkward and weird, which I love. But then, like, ten minutes into it, you can hear their, like, laughter. And they're, like, getting along with each other because they feel so connected to that little community. I just want to piggyback on that. You say that you don't do anything, but you provide the space. Um, the first time that my kid went to TR's group, they came home and they said, sorry, <laughs> mom, I found my people. Mm -hmm. And to have, that's what I love about this community, is that the support that's been shown for our children who need that safe place to find their people um, is so so incredibly important. I saw a lot of people when I was growing up that didn't have that support, that didn't have that place, and to know that there is, it's really, really, um, gets me right. <laughs> and I will just add in, um, kind of, again, going off of what TR said with, uh, the owls, um, we have a, you know, on, on campus, we have a really great group of students um, who I would say are emerging leaders and little activists and are really starting to find their footing. And um, I think a lot of it has to do also with our community partnerships and connecting them with, um, you know, Caroline and the um, uh, LGBT Center, the Cape Fear, as well as the OWLs coming up. And I think really learning from the older folks in the community and kind of allowing them to help and show our students the way. Um, and so I appreciate, one thing that I really appreciate, again, is like everybody putting back into our youth, our college students, as well as you know the younger folks in the community. So I think there's just so much investment, I feel like, um, with you know our small group. I just feel like there's so much investment in trying to really bring up the youth and bring up the college kids and say, you know, hey, this is how we've done it before, and here's how we keep moving forward together. 
I'll just say my perspective. Um, I know I'm the moderator, but I am also part of the community. And I think that in a lot of cities, there's this capital Q, capital C, queer community, and it's like the glitterati of the queer community. It's like the most active, the most whatever. Um, and I was never part of that as a journalist, right? Like, I have to keep a certain distance. Um, but I felt like when I moved to Wilmington, I found a queer community that I had never really had before anywhere else. I feel like in a small town, or a smaller town in the south, there's a little bit more solidarity between different identities. I felt more welcomed here as a bi person, um, often not included in LGBTQ communities by a lot of folks. There's a lot of gatekeeping sometimes. I've never experienced that in Wilmington, and I think that's pretty special. I just want to thank you all so much for coming and joining this panel. Um, Thank you, everybody. A big round of applause for the <laughs> Anybody have anything to add? Like a little cherry on top? I don't have anything to add, but I will say, like, I'm a product. I was raised as a child here in Wilmington within the black community and the gay community. Um, and so I have, like, that history of just experiencing both and just being, like, Im immersed in it. Um, and so I, I too feel like community is like my favorite thing about it here. Um, just being that youth, which you are raising, which all of us are now coming in contact and raising and being a part of raising. I'm like a product of that. I think I turned out pretty well. Yeah. <laughs>telling corner in the in the corner um, grace is here if you want to tell us anything on bike so that we might be able to share it on a future newsroom or for some future product on whqr if you'd rather just write a sticky note or something um, you're welcome to do so and we'll just paste them on there so you can all read each other's thoughts and thank you again for coming this has been so much fun <laughs> thank you.